please note today's session is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Thank you very much. And on behalf of the National Cancer Institute, I wish to welcome everyone to the March Advanced Topics Implementation Science webinar. Today, we are delighted to be joined by our side by Drs. Gary Bennett and Patricia Arian. They, of course, will be joined by our own Dr. David Chambers to moderate the session. A brief word about logistics and we'll be off. We ask that if you are not already on mute, to please keep your phone on mute for the duration of today's presentation. As mentioned, the session is being recorded and muting all lines will help us to avoid any background noise. We encourage questions. They can be submitted by using the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Type your question in the provided Q&A field and hit submit. Feel free to submit your questions at any time, and we'll be opening the session for questions once the discussion is closed. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, this is uh, a, another one in our set of fireside chats. And again, for those of you who haven't uh, been with us the last few months, as opposed to some of our other advanced topic webinars where we've uh, enabled uh, presenters to walk through PowerPoint presentations around particular areas of interest in implementation science, over the last few months, we've really tried to think about other ways to engage our community around thinking, you know, where have we been in implementation science and where are we going? Um, and this, uh, this one is what I see as a wonderful opportunity to hear from two experts who've really been thinking about how health information technology and implementation and science go hand in hand. Uh, so uh, both uh, Gary and, and, and Pat are, are, are favorites of ours uh, and uh, incredibly uh, talented through their careers. Gary has crossed uh, a whole range of different barriers in thinking about uh, health information technology and thinking about technology from the, the sort of startup perspective, from thinking about health interventions research uh, in his uh, faculty role at Duke, and then really thinking about how can we use the technologies that we're carrying around with us on a daily basis to better uh, engage uh, people, particularly those uh, who are traditionally underserved by our health services, uh, to, to get as good, as good care, as good advice, as good support uh, in, in, uh, in advancing their own health. Uh, so it's great to have Gary. Uh, Gary, I remember introducing at the fifth annual DNI Science Meeting as a rock star, which he truly is. Um, and uh, alongside him is another rock star, Pat Arian. Uh, Pat, I got to know uh, during my years at the National Institute of Mental Health. Uh, she recently completed a stint on the NIMH Advisory Council, where she was a voice for trying to encourage the Institute to think much more broadly about opportunities for health information technology uh, to advance every aspect of people's uh, lives in dealing with mental disorders. Um, her work has been uh, instrumental in getting us to think differently about care management, think differently about assessment of people with mental disorders and how to provide effective care. Uh, and it is so great to have both of them sharing their expertise and their experience in this. A matter. So the way, uh, as Sarah had said, this is going to work is we'll have a number of questions sort of to prompt to give a chance to hear from both uh, Gary and, and, and Pat. Uh, we'll uh, hope that you will, as questions occur to you, um, join in the conversation by typing them into the Q&A. And so we'll be as, uh, as, as flexible as possible um, and uh, really just have a chance to, to, to probe our experts for their thoughts of where we are and where we should go. Um, so with that, let me just turn uh, to an initial question, uh, maybe first for Gary and, and, and then for Pat to follow up. Just curious about how, how did you, uh, each of you first get interested in technology as a medium through which to improve health? Well, good afternoon, David, and thanks for the, uh, for the really kind introduction. Uh, you know, I have the distinction, I think, of having been a nerd for most of my life. And uh, I've been uh, tooling around on the internet uh, since I was a pretty young kid. Um, at, you know, at the time uh, when I first started, you know, you connected to the internet through bulletin board services and things like that. And so I've been playing around for a long time and I've been coding for a long time. I just haven't ever gotten very good at it. Um, so I, I've, I've sort of kept these as parallel existences. So working on the internet and coding, uh, you know, during at night and during the day, I was trying to advance a research career in, uh, in health intervention research. And um, I got very interested in the combination of the two strategies when I started to see uh, in my in the early research that we were doing some evidence of 
folks in medically vulnerable communities really being early adopters of a very early mobile uh, devices. Um, they, at the time, they were, these were very inexpensive cell phones, but they allowed us to, to do some interesting things with them, and I started to see them in, in the low-income populations in which we were doing our work. And um, that, combined with some early evidence from colleagues, suggested that, the, that marrying my two, my two loves, technology uh, and, and intervention science at the time, might be a, a way for us to try to reach out and to engage the populations that we in, in the scientific community had labeled as hard to reach. And so for the last almost 15 years now, I've been, been doing work of that type. Awesome. Pat? Yes, hi. Um, uh, welcome, everybody, and uh, I, uh, also, um, David, thank you so, for the nice introduction. Uh, so I'm a little older, I think, than Gary. Uh, I, um, <laughs> my first foray into technology and health, uh, I also have always been an early adopter geek. I had one of the first Palm Pilots, if anybody remembers what that is. Um, but when I was a graduate student, uh, my first foray into technology and health was on a Robert Wood Johnson uh, foundation funded grant to see whether or not biofeedback technology uh, in combination with physical therapy could help uh, uh, older African American men who'd suffered strokes and had not regained the use of their affected limbs um, after a year of, of uh, physical therapy. And we had the unique distinction of being the very first people in uh, the hospital I was working at, which was Goldwater Memorial Hospital, for having the very first color computer monitor, which was limited to three primary colors, um, and the feedback was basically these bar graphs as people were trying to make a fist, uh, and using that feedback to, uh, you know, uh, improve their ability to uh, engage in, in simple motor tasks. Uh, but really where I started to dive in was um, the National Institute of Mental Health for a while had this mechanism where by academic researchers could partner with, you know, counties or community mental health centers to create innovations in research to address implementation and quality issues. And I had one of these mechanisms, and um, uh, when um, the ARA supplements were released, we had applied for a supplement to our center to create a, a, an electronic um, health record for the agency that could um, help clinicians make decisions based on questions that they would ask patients. And so make it, helping them, using technology to help them make clinical decisions around what kind of intervention they should provide, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, literacy materials should they give their, um, their patients. And, um, and so that was really kind of, at the time, and exciting opportunity, and we decided to use, and iPads had just come out, so we were using this, actually eventually popped this technology onto iPads that clinicians could carry around the clinic. Um, at the same time, uh, we also applied for um, an ARA-funded um, pilot project through the National Library of Medicine to create a smart note to further support clinicians in their decision-making working with uh, older patients with depression um, and when they were using problem-solving treatment. So the smart note uh, basically uh, utilized um, uh, previous clinical records that we had as well as clinical outcomes to, and, and we were, this was really early in the day where we, we were using machine learning technologies to come up with algorithms of uh, where we could predict how people were going to do uh, at a certain point based on um, notes that clinicians were writing in the records. So a lot of the early work I did with technology was around supporting clinicians and decision decision-making and enhancing their quality of care. Cool. And at what point did you, uh, did you sort of turn your attention to uh, dissemination and implementation as a, as a research goal? And maybe, Pat, you want to start off? Um, in general or just in terms of technology? <laughs> uh, well, so how about both? Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, I've been interested in access to care uh, for uh, high quality care for a very long time, and as an intern at Bellevue Memorial Hosp at Bellevue Hospital, um, I had had the opportunity to be 
you know, work in what I saw was one of the very early versions of integrated care where um, in the geriatric outpatient clinic at the time, this is in uh, 1989, uh, the uh, mental health clinic and the primary care clinic were pretty much integrated. They were only divided by a um, the waiting room. Uh, so the mental health clinic uh, was on one side of the waiting room and the primary care clinic was on the other side and had the luxury of being able to have a primary care physician do like a mini mental status exam or, you know, um, you know, a, a depression screen and just come over to me and say, um, I'm going to bring this patient to you. I would, would you mind talking to her, lost her husband, et cetera, et cetera. So I've always been fascinated with, and I've always worked with populations who historically don't use traditional mental health services. So this idea of integrating, um, you know, uh, mental health services into non-traditional mental health settings has always been intriguing for me. Um, I got really interested in the way that technology could facilitate um, really more um, implementation from the perspective of, like I said earlier, quality of care, like can we support clinicians in making decision making, but then also just simply um, getting behavioral interventions out there into the hands of, of the community. So as Gary had pointed out, the, um, you know, ubiqu ubiquity of, of mobile devices is really just been incredible across, you know, uh, socioeconomic status, across, um, you know, uh, ethnic minority communities. And uh, so when I guess, I, to be honest, when I started to get frustrated with how hard it was to train clinicians in evidence-based practices, I decided, well, why don't we just cut through the middleman <laughs> and put these interventions on smartphones and see whether or not people would, if this was another way of increasing access to quality of care. Um, and, and Gary, uh, where, where'd you, uh, what, what inspired you to, th to be thinking more about dissemination implementation research? Yeah, well, I think I, I entered uh, the, the field, I think, in, if for reasons that are similar to, to many people, you know, in as much as I, I was frustrated uh, about the effort and time and intensity of, of, our, of our work and the strength of our outcomes and the inability to see uh, those tools translated into the hands of real people. And, um, and I think, you know, I, I didn't, didn't find the field of DNI research right away. I, I found it after I got involved in uh, in startups, and so um, you know I have have long had an interest in in translation via um, commercialization and um, and an early company um, that I was involved in um, after uh, after growing that company a little bit um, I took a, a short leave from my academic position and worked inside of uh, the company that ultimately acquired our startup which is a large uh, a disease management company that had 20 some odd million lives under management and um, and in working there I got to, to really see the process of um, from of dissemination from a very different perspective and um, we were involved in in disseminating the innovations that we'd created um, and that were evidence-based. And, and then when I was, was working in industry, I had a chance of, to be involved in the process of, of identifying how to, how to locate evidence-based tools, how to um, get them into the hands of our clients at the time, um, and then how to study their outcomes all in the context of industry. And, and to, be, to be really honest, I was blown away um, by how similar the processes were in industry and in my academic um, hat. The currency of, for, for judging one's success is a little bit different, um, but, the, but the actual process and the conversations and the intentions and the goals were, were very similar. Uh, and so then when I, I came back to academia, I was found the field and was really was really thrilled um, about it. And I viewed DNI science at the time as a way of, as, as hopefully finding, I was hopeful that I could find a place that would help us um, to better uh, disseminate the kinds of tools that we'd had some success doing um, through these other approaches. Um, and, um, and so I've been, been been very happy to be a member of the community ever since, um, and and have been and still and, and as I've as digital has grown, um, I think uh, in some ways it's, it's lagged other areas in the DNI research community uh, for some reasons I think we'll get into in just a little bit. But nevertheless, I still I still hold true to that that initial interest in in using DNI science to actually do accomplish the goal of really disseminating and getting these innovations into the hands of of uh, patients and providers. Uh, 
Cool. Uh, you know, I found that just in talking with investigators that often it's hard to try and identify beyond just saying we want to create an app for this or an app for that or some sort of new technology to try and pinpoint what are the key research questions that are most important to tackle. And we have that potential to just keep creating a whole bunch of new widgets that, that may, you know, further exacerbate the challenge of who actually has access to any of them. I, I wonder when, when each of you jumped into this area, how did you uh, sort of uh, um, come up with the specific research questions to tackle in this space of technology and, and, and health? And Gary, maybe uh, you can start us off. Sure. So, so we're fundamentally interested in, in how to uh, improve the treatment of obesity using these kinds of low-cost digital devices in the primary care setting. And we, and we work uh, almost exclusively in community health centers. Um, and so our, you know, the questions there from a, from a DNI perspective really concern um, questions of engagement. How do we, how do we get uh, providers to use these tools, um, what's the nature of, of their use, how does it, how does it uh, interfere in some cases with their workflow, um, and then we have, of course, similar parallel questions for, for patients. Are patients using the tools? Are they uh, using them in the ways that we expect? Um, what are the roadblocks? What are the challenges to their, to their use? What are outcomes um, that are produced? What are some of the unexpected outcomes that are, that are, are, are experienced in the context of these kinds of, of treatments? We've, we've been guided in our work mostly by reAIM, so we've we've used reAIM to try to help us to formulate questions, important questions related to reach and representativeness and effectiveness and adoption, implementation and maintenance, and so on. And so it was it was really critical for us in the in the early stages of our work to have a framework like reAIM to to guide our to guide our efforts, um, and that's taken us that's taken us a long way. Um, I would say that um, as we've as as we've gotten more into the work in, in recent years, um, some of those some of those questions have changed. I think these days we are we're getting much more interested in questions of cost um, and questions of long term sustainability. You know the the um, the sustainability of digital health interventions, particularly those that are patient facing and that are not. Uh, Inter integrated into the electronic health record um, raises a whole host of questions from a DNI perspective that are um, that are that are different than those that I think face other other areas. Who's going to host these servers? How much uptime do you need? What are the privacy considerations? What are the customer service and technical support needs? A, a wide range of actual of implementation questions that that really have to do with the the hosting and the maintenance of the technology itself. So we're we're getting more and more um, interested in those sets of questions, and then at the at the same time, we are, are starting increasingly to move into um, actually one of the observations I think that we made in, in our early work is that um, you know we tend to try to situate our technology at the nexus of patient provider uh, and the system itself, and so we really see our technologies as sitting sitting amidst of those various stakeholders. Um, but in some ways, that's that's a somewhat of a, of a counterintuitive way to think about digital. I think the way that most of us tend to think about digital intervention. Um, is that we tend to think of them as the apps that are on our phone. They exist in a standalone capacity without a lot of human support, without integration with providers. And so in the last couple of years, we've gotten much more interested in this question of how do you disseminate actual standalone treatments? Not actually a lot of good outcomes evidence for these kinds of tools. Um, but And we've, we've gotten more interested in, in, in your question, David. If you're not going to just build a new app, what do you do to get an evidence-based treatment um, disseminated through a digital strategy? Strategy. Um, how do you do that without a human being involved, and how do you do that at scale? Um, and so that's a that's a, a new line of work for us that um, that we're starting to investigate um, using a wide range of, of new methods that that I'm happy to talk about if there's interest. Well, Pat, how how do you identify particular questions to focus on? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the the technology for me is really just in the service of uh, addressing access and um, quality questions, right? So, you know, when I start to think about when I started thinking about the use of technology for um, improving access to care, uh, you know, it was really about this issue of um, how hard it is for in my field, which is you know treatment of depression, um, how hard it is for you know people in this day and aged actually access care, even if they wanted to. So, you know, we were getting a lot of, um, you know, as we were doing kind of like 
non-research implementation of strategies like collaborative care, uh, and I would be on, you know, to help, you know, uh, care managers do their, like, teach them how to do their job, uh, you know, I was very aware of how in, in you know, how hard it is that even though you may have taken away the stigma by integrating mental health services into primary care medicine, you still didn't correct the problem of how for behavioral interventions you need to come in and see somebody once a week. And, uh, and a lot of community agencies were really struggling with this model, um, particularly in some communities like the Latino community in California where, um, uh, where we would be working with clinics that were serving um, undocumented workers and uh, they, you know, typically, you know, they were the choice between I have a job today, um, you know, that somebody offered me or I come in for my appointment and they're going to take the job. And so really, so I started to think like, well, how does technology take care of that particular issue for the participant, you know, for the patient? Um, you know, uh, how can I extend the reach of the clinician? Uh, and traditional models have been like using human beings, like, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, field work workers or health workers to kind of go out and check in on people, but, you know, when I start to think about the, the, the fact that that's, that's expensive, um, those people also need to be trained. Uh, they're hard to identify. Um, it's really hard to find people who, for instance, are bilingual and who can do this kind of work. Uh, and uh, so couldn't, you know, given the fact that people, these are, these are people who had technologies, could we transfer some of the tasks to the phone or could we transfer some of the tasks to the internet um, to help uh, check in on people, make sure that they're, um, that they're uh, doing better. Um, another thing too is uh, that for mental health, our treatments and our uh, assessment tools are cumbersome. And uh, there's a lot that technology could do to help kind of get rid of some of the multiple decision points that clinicians have to make in terms of like, you know, when I see this kind of patient in front of me and I try this intervention and it doesn't work, what's next for me to do? Um, the automation that machine learning, um, you know, in some cases natural language processing can facilitate um, that making that decision-making quicker for the clinician uh, just seems like it would help a lot with, with the quality. So I guess the, the, the short answer to that question is that I'm always thinking about, you know, what the, what the struggle is that the clinician and the patient is having in utilizing these services and that just because you, technology is really boomed in this area, uh, I've naturally gravitated towards what can technology can take care of. I think Gary raises a really good point about how much technology can actually do and how much needs to be supported by human beings. We, um, we recently, well, a year ago, <laughs> completed this very large scale remote randomized clinical trial where we randomized people to three different um, depression apps and followed people for 12 weeks to see what their outcomes were like. And this was originally designed as a feasibility study where we only had intended to recruit 150 people, but we hit that number very quickly. We hit 150 in the first week. Uh, and so we got permission from NIMH and from our IRB to continue doing the study. And, and basically, in a matter of five weeks, recruit, we screened 3,000 people and uh, randomized about t um, 1,200 people into this study. And what was interesting was that the, the, our reach was that so um, impressive that we our demographics of our sample maps on perfectly to the U.S. Census Bureau's um, estimates of minority status in the United States. And um, the trick is, though, it was really hard to keep people engaged after couple of weeks, after four weeks. They showed really nice improvement, which says something about potentially the power of these interventions, um, the fact that they, you know, somebody can use them when they need them. They don't have to wait a week before they see a, quote unquote, get a therapeutic dose of something. Um, but at the same time, uh, there, after we'd done focused interviews with some of the participants, there, was a, there were some people who said it would have really helped if I had somebody to actually, you know, communicate with, even if it was through 
SMS or text messaging or IM um, to ask some questions about how I was struggling with using the app. Uh, so I, I don't think we'll ever replace human beings completely, but we may be able to ex increase their efficiency through the use of these interventions. I'm going to jump in really quickly and just say thank you so much to those who've already submitted questions. I've gotten a couple through the chat. You're welcome to use that or the Q&A feature, and I'm putting them into queue. So I'm going to let David keep going with some of the questions we've played it already, but definitely send those in. I'm recording them, and we'll ask them just a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and thanks, both of you, for uh, the answers so far. Um, so, you know, I, I know I think the first computer that I was exposed to was an Apple II prior to the Apple II Plus, and at some point I, I did get a, a, a crack at the original IBM PC. Um, obviously, things have changed since then. I was just curious if each of you, over the course of uh, the work that you've been conducting, the research that you've been conducting, what you see as some of the major changes uh, um, the, uh, in, in technology and, and how that's influenced your thinking about, about research to pursue. Uh, Gary, you want to start us off? Sure. Uh, so my first computer was an Atari 2600 and moved to a 2 and a 2E and 2GS. Um, and and uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's, been a long, it's been a long road. You know, I think I've, I'd say the technology has changed markedly, although I, you know, I, have my, I think I have a bit of a polar opinion on this topic. I think it's, um, you know, in my experience, hardware changes very, very rapidly. We've seen enormous hardware changes in, say, the last 10 years. Um, software changes a lot, too. Um, but differently in ways that I think are, are, are different than hard hardware. Um, you know, we're all still using Microsoft Word, and we're all, we're all still using the same, a lot of us are still using Internet Explorer, I'm sorry to say. Um, software packages don't change quite as quickly. If you look at the leading, say, smartphone apps for fitness and weight loss, they have remained, the top five have remained, um, acquisitions aside, have remained pretty stable since the uh, release of the, uh, of the App Store in, in 2008. So, um, Particularly if one is keeping a code base, languages change, right? If you if you coded for the Palm operating system a while ago, that's that's gone. So languages change, but if you if you do a good job about keeping your code base updated and porting that code base to, to new languages and new platforms as they emerge, um, it's 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 somewhat less. The, the changes are somewhat less challenging on the software side, and and so that's one of the reasons I I think it's really important for those of us, particularly in the behavioral science community, um, to be very thoughtful about designing technologies that are largely designing software and thinking about software and designing that in a way um, that that is more or less platform agnostic. Um, and there are lots of different strategies for for accomplishing that. Um, I think you know one of the trends that we've seen. Um, we've obviously entered a mobile revolution, and that's done a lot of things. Not the least of which is democratize access to the internet in ways that I think we couldn't have, couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. Um, but the telephone as a as a as a treatment tool, as a digital treatment tool, I think is enormously important. And, and in this case, I actually don't mean smartphones. Um, we, we use interactive voice response, which is like an automated telephone call um, and text messaging to, to, with great success in medically vulnerable communities. We have near, near you know, 100% penetration of those technologies in the samples in which we work. And the engagement with those technologies is extraordinarily high. Um, we're just finishing a trial now, uh, a, a two-year randomized controlled trial of a one-year long weight loss treatment intervention in community health centers. And we ask patients to use our app, which is basically involves uh, speaking to an interactive voice response call um, uh, once a week and getting automated tailored feedback and, and skills training through the phone. Um, and at the end of one year, um, we had a median engagement rate of 93.2%, which essentially means that people took their calls uh, a lot. And those kinds of technologies, uh, we, you know, we can, we've had a lot of success in smartening what are relatively dumb technologies, um, and that has become, um, I think, a, 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 a a really important way of us capitalizing on the digital revolution. Um, I'd say one one other quick change that I've noticed that's that's very important in our world, and that is that the nature of interfaces has changed a lot. These days, um, most of the folks that we work with in, in medically vulnerable communities um, have never used a keyboard. 
they have only used a touch screen. And so we, we use tablets as a matter of course because they, people don't have experience with mice and keyboards. Um, and the thing that I think is happening now that's going to change things immensely going forward and, um, and I think even make, make our, our lives even, even more uh, interesting um, is the emergence of voice as, a, as an interface. And, and we're beginning to get involved in that as well. Tools like the you know, Amazon Alexa, um, the Echo, and, and, uh, and other types of voice entry tools um, I think are going to make it much easier easier to put technologies in the home close to people um, and to, to get a lot of the, um, you know, sort of challenging data entry interfaces out of the equation. Right. Pat, uh, thoughts about how uh, technology has changed? A couple of uh, thoughts on yeah, that? Yeah, I don't have much more to add <laughs> to what Gary um, said because I would agree 100 percent with everything he said that, um, you know, I, I do think that uh, one way that we might be thinking about um, different kinds of technologies that we haven't thought about is therapeutic. Um, it, you know, it, it, I might just add a couple of words there where um, I have been working with a company that has created, um, uh, you know, basically taking cognitive remediation strategies that we that we know can enhance cognition in people with depression and attention deficit disorder and popping it into a video game environment. Um, and that that kind of work uh, is just, you know, and, and not, and I don't mean like, you know, um, some companies where they just take these cognitive tasks and they don't, you know, all they do is make them pretty. Um, in this case, it's using technology um, as well as, again, like um, engineering mechanics to create really challenging cognitive um, training um, games. But put but because they're so, they tend to be so hard and tedious, uh, putting them in a game, video game environment that can um, enhance the enjoyment factor of doing that cognitive training. Um, and I think, you know, that's just starting to emerge as a potential way of, um, you know, uh, potentially engaging children, um, engaging, uh, you know, maybe young adults who that's how they like to interact. Uh, and so putting therapeutics into a, a video game might be a way of really enhancing um, treatment access. Uh, my colleague Skip Rizzo at uh, University of uh, uh, Southern California has done a lot of work with video game environments for things like exposure therapy to PTSD, um, as well as creating virtual therapists. Uh, I don't know how successful the virtual therapist might be, but certainly what Gary was pointing to using um, tools like Alexa or Google Home might be um, more palatable because, you know, the, the fakey look of a therapist might be disconcerting, but simply talking to Alexa or hearing the voice um, might be another way of uh, enhancing uh, access to care. So, uh, and then I know that there are colleagues of mine here at the University of Washington who are starting to explore virtual reality uh, and augmented reality technologies for things like cognitive training, um, potentially, uh, uh, you know, uh, social, uh, for kids with autism, um, you know, social connection, social communication, uh, but using sort of these immersive environments to really make that process feel real to them. Great, thanks. So uh, we're seeing uh, some wonderful questions coming in. I'm going to sort of combine a couple into uh, hopefully one that doesn't uh, anger either of the people who have questioned, uh, who have submitted the question. But it, it really comes with, uh, I think it reflects, it, at least in one case, of, of something that Gary had said about some of the similarities of, of developing and testing tools uh, between research and industry that you had found. And, and that questioner, as well as another, asks this thing, uh, asks about how we know that typically biomedical research, and that funded by NIH, is relatively slow moving, and yet technology is so rapidly uh, changing, and that industry often has the ability to, um, you know, to be iterative. Uh, so uh, the question, at least, that comes out of this, are, are there things that we can do in thinking about the funding of, of various research studies that better support the evolution of health IT, given its rapid move? Um, I don't know, Gary, do you want to have any thoughts about that? Uh, just a few dozen. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I um you know I think it's I, I think there's a lot there's a lot to say here unfortunately but let me let me try to be um, concise I I um 
you know, it's true that industry tends to be agile and 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 quickly and, and moves quickly. The other the other thing that I think we sometimes don't give credit industry enough credit for is that industry also tends to be very attentive to data, and so um, some of the most impressive data collection. Um, uh, infrastructures that I've ever seen have been in industry. Um, you'd be hard pressed to argue that Facebook doesn't have a top notch uh, data science core, and they tend to make uh, evidence based and data data informed decisions uh, as a rule. Um, that's been the case for many of the startups that I that I that I've worked with or that I've, I've encountered. Um, it's just that they tend, in, you know, in some of these startups, many of them even subject a lot of questions to randomized control trials. Um, again, you know. If you load up Facebook right now, you probably are in a randomized controlled trial testing some design feature that they are evaluating. Um, the, the, the case is that, you know, certainly not all companies, those companies that don't have the scale of Facebook certainly are not doing RCTs, but they tend to be very, very attentive to data. Um, and yet those data tend, tend to be observational data um, and data that are perhaps not collected with the same kind of sophistication or granularity that we would be, um, that we would be um, comfortable with. And I think that's a message for, for both sides. Um, you know, perhaps we'll get a chance to talk about partnerships later. I think partnerships are, are critical in this space. Um, I think we as a, as a field and funders have to get more comfortable with uh, non-RCT based designs for um, examining outcomes. Um, I'm, I'm part of a startup right now um, where we have one of the world's largest collections of, of data on, on weight and we're able to model um, with a high degree of, op of, of granularity um, trajectories of change in weight. But that's all observational data that probably wouldn't pass muster for a lot of a lot of folks um, who would be reviewing grants of this type. And so I think we're going to we'll have to funders will have to um, uh, be help us to to guide us to a greater appreciation um, for d different research designs that might allow us to answer questions or to detect signals um, in in something like a more more rapid way. Um, and I think you know the the nature of digital technologies, digital health, software design, modern software design is that iteration is absolutely key to that. Um, we, it's wholly insufficient to imagine a digital technology that gets created and rolled out without some expectation of iteration and redesign on the basis of, of how it performs in the hands of, of its users. And so I think we have to get comfortable with designs, uh, maybe multi-part studies, um, more use of single case designs, um, a range of different adaptive trial designs that will allow us to exploit that, uh, those those kinds of features. In general, I think, um, you know, we, we, the funders, I think, in this space, we have to have funding mechanisms um, that allow us to get closer to what real dissemination looks like, to minimize the gap between dissemination science and real dissemination. And that is one of the, this is, this is one of those areas. Pat, suggestions that you have or thoughts that you have about, uh, uh, about you know, how to fund this kind of research in, in a more uh, sort of flexible, iterative, or otherwise way. Right. So we, we spent, so um, I co-chaired a workshop, uh, a work group for uh, NIMH on this very topic about, you know, um, using technology, how to support technology-based research. Um, and, you know, we talked a lot about this, and, and Gary's right on a lot of fronts that there are a number of uh, research methodologies that we could be utilizing and learning from, you know, the areas of, like, human-centered design and computer uh, science and engineering that would help us, you know, I think it's really more on the reviewer and the program and being a little bit more tolerant of the fact that if you're going to be using or building a technological solution that there's actually a process that doesn't look like what we're typically used to in health sciences. Uh, so education about that um, and allowing some flexibility in um, appreciating the design differences is important. But another, you know, another way to look at this too is that, um, you know, we talked a lot about in the work group that we're not trying to if you're not trying to build a product, which is what a lot of companies are kind of focused on, what's my product, but you're really testing a principle, then the idea of doing a clinical trial, uh, you know, like for instance, say you, you propose to do a clinical trial in a health setting using um, technology to support a principle of implementation. Uh, so for instance, improving, using technology to improve the quality of, of clinician care. Um, that the fact that the technology itself might change because of advances in 
you know, I don't know, better battery life or, you know, or just basically the interface looks a little different. Um, and, but you're not fundamentally changing the principle that we need to be a little bit more tolerant of allowing the technology to move during the course of the study while you're still, as long as the principle that you're testing itself hasn't changed, that that's okay, that it's not fundamentally going to break or, or change your outcomes just because, you know, you, you move from like a, a laptop to an iPad, um, but the intervention itself, the principle, that's still being tested. Uh, so I think it's one of those things where we used to struggle a lot with this, right, at NIMH about, you know, at what point does an adaptation or a change become simply just a minor tweak versus a complete overhaul of an intervention? Um, if you just keep translating things or testing things in one population or another, but the intervention itself is still treating depression, you know, at some point that becomes very iterative. Uh, so if, if for what whatever reason, um, Epic changes the way that they um, organize their health record, but the principle that you're testing is still the same, we should just not worry about that. So I, I, I'm not sure if that was clear, but it's really about separating out the principle that you're testing, like what is the barrier I'm testing, what is the solution that I'm testing, and it's simply, and it, I'm not worrying about the fact that the t technology itself that's, that's supporting it might you know, change over time because that's the way, that's what happens with technology, then I think we're okay. Uh, so a lot depends on kind of the question, uh, the purpose of the study. Uh, if you really are building a brand new product, yes, we have to be much more flexible about the design. Uh, but if you're really just testing a principle and technology is just supporting that, then I wouldn't worry so much about the fact that technology changes. And yeah, and I, I think it, it that reminds me of what, what Gary was talking about earlier and the idea of trying to be platform agnostic, um, and, and yeah, it sounds like the prince, you know, focusing on testing principles versus testing on the particular widget in its current form with this current population could spin out infinite numbers of studies uh, right. if we're not careful. Um, great. So I uh, wanted to ask, because I think there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in, in how best to navigate doing research in this space and, and thinking about the partnerships that are needed. Wonder if each of you could talk a little bit about experience you have, suggestions you have for folks in this area as to who to partner with, how to how to consider different partners. Um, maybe Gary, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have you get the first word. Sure. Um, well, I think you know there's there's. Um, uh, the, the work that we tend to do, again, is, is tends to be patient-facing and, and largely uh, we tend to dock into the electronic health record, but that we tend to, our, our interventions are generally exist outside of it. Um, so with that in mind, um, you know, it's been critical for us to have very strong relationships with uh, with health systems, and you know, we have a long-standing relationship with a fantastic network of community health centers here in North Carolina um, that are really interested in, in not, not necessarily really interested in testing the latest, greatest, fancy, new, shiny technology, but really in trying to understand better ways of leveraging technology to improve uh, their quality of care, the efficiency of their clinical practice, and to help to extend the clinical encounter to accommodate patient needs that are largely outside of their kind of the, the more acute crises that they tend to see. So, you know, the, the, the health centers that we work in gen generally have, um, you know, extraordinarily high rates of, of diabetes. Uh, and obesity and all the sort of related conditions, but, but treating weight and doing weight counseling and physical activity promotion counseling are really largely outside of their, of their um, uh, core abilities in the context of any given clinical encounter. So, so they're very interested in using technology in that way to, to sort of extend the clinical encounter and deal with some of these, these, these conditions uh, uh, outside, of, outside of the clinic. Uh, and so to that end, I think it's just been instrumental for us to have a strong partner that's very interested in technology and interested in digital in this way. Way, and that affords us to, uh, some some access to to their core uh, data resources, so that we can do interesting things with the data. Um, and that's been that's that partnership has been been really instrumental. You know, I'd, I'd say for the field, I think one of the big challenges for us is that the, the primary adopters of digital health technologies today uh, tend to be industry, um, and they tend not to be health systems um, uh, and and payers. They you know they they certainly are adopters, but the, but the primary adopters uh, tend to be vendors.
factors of one sort or another. And we know very, very little about the kinds of considerations that go into um, their choices to adopt a given technology. Um, and we don't really have a strong sense of how a given wellness vendor or an electronic health record company or a patient portal company or an HRA company, the, the primary adopters these days of, of digital tools like the ones that I create, startups, we don't really have a clear sense of how they, um, of how they consider evidence in, uh, amidst the range of different adoption considerations that they might be um, working with. Uh, we don't have a sense of how they consider things like cost and what kinds of cost savings, returns on investment, what kind of outcomes they might be interested in. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, my, from my industry experience, um, you know, the actual clinical outcomes are, are absolutely critical, but they sort of fit amidst a, a wider range of outcomes, things like you know, satisfaction and quality of life and whether or not a given treatment is going to reduce membership churn and engagement and other kinds of downstream things like medication adherence that might be largely secondary to whatever kind of treatment you're delivering. You know, the doctors tend to have a much more holistic view as opposed to looking for change on any clinical endpoint that might be something that we write into a grant. And I just think in general, we know very, very, very little about what those adoption considerations are, uh, particularly as it relates to adopting what can tend to be very expensive digital technologies. So I'd love to see more partnerships of that type so that we can get more data to help to make that, uh, that process, the dissemination process, uh, more efficient. Cool. Pat, can you talk a little bit about partnerships that you've uh, learned from, benefited from, or, or, or uh, encourage people to seek out as, as they navigate this space? Yeah, in fact, I can even give a little advice about what to look for in a partnership, too, because I've worked with companies. I still work with a couple of companies. I've, wor I've worked with um, people from different disciplines that are, um, you know, and, and a lot of who you partner with will depend on what you're trying to do. So, um, for instance, any anything that I've done where, you know, um, this is a tool that's going to be used by a health plan like, say, Kaiser Permanente or, you know, Group Health Cooperative that has an electronic health record, I automatically have to you know, make sure I'm working with somebody who understands um, electronic health records. So that means working with somebody from bioinformatics. Uh, and, you know, sometimes I'll get, have a comment about how to work these relationships, but, um, you know, oftentimes people who are in bioinformatics are mostly interested in how to use these large scale data sets to answer questions, right? About, particularly, you know, about like, um, making treatment decisions and so forth, uh, but they also understand a lot about how do you take a tool that would facilitate the quality of care and, and have it interoperate with the electronic health record. So, um, you know, they have their own approach for doing that. I, it's not something that I feel like I have to sit down and study and learn, but as long as it, we know, you know, what the outcome is, how we want this new tool to work in the, um, um, be embedded in the workflow of clinicians life uh, that, you know, they can help immensely with thinking about how that would look in the, in the um, like, uh, uh, electronic record like EPIC, for instance. And EPIC is not easy, um, and everybody will tell you that, uh, and uh, the lore around here is that you build a tool for EPIC and you've built that one tool for EPIC and you've spent all your money and have gotten very little out of it. Um, so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of how you work with companies like, big companies like this, like EPIC, um, but uh, a bioinformaticist and a computer science, uh, computer, um, science engineer can be really helpful in thinking through those things. Um, when it comes to designing new, like, um, like for instance, in my area, behavioral interventions, what has been really fascinating to me is working with people who do user-centered design work. And so I've worked with I've worked with a company called IDEO, which is a huge design company. They do. They design everything from toilet seats to, um, you know, health apps, uh, and you know, um, and, and their approach, which fascinated me, is very much what I used to do with, um, you know, participant action research, which is really getting a lot of information about, um, in their case, you know, the user, the context the user lives in, uh, what their users' values are, and then designing around, um, you know, around the user uh, and making sure that anything we develop um, has low burden, um, you know, is easily accessible. Uh, if people's values and goals change, so for instance, I work with some 
people who do uh, food diaries, um, you know, and they've, they, um, here at the University of Washington, and they've been really, you know, basically pretty clear that people's goals when they use food diaries change over time. So that means that the food diary itself has to be flexible and, and change over time. My colleague David Moore at Northwestern is very much building on that principle of um, for depression by creating these really mini kind of like mental health widgets that people can select and choose and put together however they like, um, you know, basically because what people want one day is different one that, from what they want from the next day. So, so you know, par partnering with, um, you don't have to design, partner with a design company. IDEO is very expensive. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that unless you had a huge grant. But, um, you know, there are a lot of, my, like, uh, you might find colleagues in, in your academic institutions, um, you know, and these are people who are usually either in an art department or they're in computer science and engineering, who that is their, that is their world. They study human behavior uh, from the perspective of how do we design things so that um, they're usable and people will actually, uh, you know, hook into them and not drop them after a couple of weeks. So, um, you know, human-centered design, um, I really, bioinformatics, I really love working with um, people who do big data analysis because the products that they can come up with to help support decision making, um, you know, would be, is going to be really fascinating. Um, I worked with a company called Ginger IO for a very long time, um, and their initial tool, and so this gets into, like, what it's like to work with a company, um, their initial tool was very much about mobile sensing of um, and mood prediction uh, so could they basically came up with an algorithm that um, uh, that can predict whether or not you're going to be depressed in a couple of days or you're going to experience more depression uh, based on physical activity and social connectedness, like how much social media do you use, how many emails do you return, how many uh, text messages do you um, respond to or send out. Um, and it was great because they had this built-in tool. We could plop it into our study, uh, and we got some really nice, you know, correlational data. The downside, though, is that their company, uh, we couldn't get any raw data, so it was impossible for us to do our own modeling of, you know, predicting um, depression outcomes based on these metrics. We had to rely completely on the company and just trust that what they were generating for us was real. Uh, and uh, then they, mid for one study, um, they basically had to back out because they changed their business model. Uh, and this is not unusual for a lot of startups um, who have um, angel funding where the VC or the venture capitalists might change their mind about how, willing, how long they want to wait for you to develop your tool and say you need to sell something now. Uh, and so that's what we kind of faced with, um, with a couple of companies where, you know, right when you're ready to work with them, they're no longer available to you either because they've changed their business plan or because they've gone bankrupt and they're not there anymore. Uh, so you ha I think it's great to work with companies, but I think you have to be really careful too about, you know, how stable they are, how stable their product is, and whether or not um, they're open to sharing some of the raw data that they collect to help you with your science, how collaborative that is. So that's, I would say, it's one of the caveats of working outside of academia. The plus side is that they're nimble and they, have a, they often have a lot of immediate money to spend on doing something really beautiful that you probably couldn't afford on an NIH funded proposal um, and so you do get these really nice um, tools uh, but in the end it's, it's kind of hard to to publish for instance data um, when you can't even talk about what the algorithm that went into coming up with the outcome great so so we only have a few minutes left and I'm conscious of, of trying to get in a few more of these questions that folks have uh, have uh, offered to us um, uh, so uh, one of them uh, notes that Gary had mentioned re-aim as a helpful framework for generating research questions. Uh, Pat, I wonder if you might be able to just quickly reflect on any other frameworks that you've found uniquely helpful in informing implementation research uh, in this area, in the area of technology. Any frameworks pop up? 
Um, well, you know, more recently it's been, um, you know, pr participant action research and um, user-centered design that uh, so much of what uh, the interventions that I try have been trying to implement suffer from design flaws. And so the, a principle of really thinking about what is it that the, the consumer and the clinician want out of the, you know, therapeutic interaction, what's their workflow like, um, really thinking about, uh, you know, the context in which they're doing treatment, um, I find is, is super important and um, very helpful in designing uh, new solutions for um, implementing best practices. Cool. Uh, another question came in, whether either of you have experience using hybrid designs to test implementation of technology-based interventions? So do you mean like um, hybrid efficacy effectiveness or hybrid effect, uh, effectiveness implementation? I would assume it would be the latter. The latter. Yeah, I effectiveness implementation. Yeah, I personally have not, I don't think I've done that yet, no. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Gary, you? <laughs> no, okay. <we> okay. <laughs> but it's a great opportunity for folks who are listening to uh, jump into that space. Um, wanted to get your advice, so we have folks listening at various stages of their career. Um, advice that you have for, for people who are earlier in their career who are contemplating a, a, a career in, in dissemination and implementation research, particularly as it relates to technology. What advice do you have for folks? Um, Pat, you want to start us off? Um, yeah, I would say go for it. This is really, for me, I, I feel like this is the place to be, and, you know, um, the the big part is really making the being a connector and making those partnerships um, with people. Uh, that's going to be, um, you know, whether it's the community organization or it is with um, other scientists uh, who can help you think through the problem you're tra trying to solve from their perspective uh, is really critical. So it's I think this is exciting times, and particularly with um, you know how much healthcare technology has blown up and become. Um, an important thing. Uh, uh, there's a lot of avenues and a lot of opportunities for um, you to do really good science in this space. Gary, advice for folks? Yeah, I I, um, I totally agree. This is a wonderful area, and it's very exciting and fast moving, um, and it's one of the you know I think if one has interdisciplinary leanings, this this is one that can can allow you to kind of fully exploit those interests. Um, I you know just a few really specific suggestions. I think um, I think that folks in this space should learn. Tech, learn tech. You know, you should learn a little tech. It doesn't mean that need, you need to be a, a a coder or you know take a take an advanced Ruby class. But you know, I have to say, like you know, very few of us, many many, if not most of us, uh, you know, work with closely with biostatisticians to do our work on our analyses. Um, but we wouldn't imagine guiding a set of analyses without having taken some classes in stat. And similarly, I think it's really it's important here to have a sense of of technology. Um, there are some the good news on that is that it's easier than ever to be able to to get up to speed in just very basic coding basics. Um, there's a fantastic series of, of free webinars online that allow, that are sort of framed around uh, technology for non-technologists. Um, so I think there are very easy ways to ramp up um, in this space, but it's, it, it does behoove you to do that. Um, I'd say the other thing is that um, this, this field doesn't exist purely in the scientific journals, um, and the sort of the scholarship in this space doesn't, doesn't only exist there. Uh, and in fact, I think given the, the youth of the field and the, the speed with which it's moving, it's important to really look beyond um, the academic literature. Um, it's critical, I think, here to read blogs, to listen to podcasts, to get on Twitter. Um, a lot of the discussion about new technologies, new approaches, emerging trends, and those things really appear uh, in those kinds of places first. Um, and then the other thing I'd say, I think Pat's point about getting out and getting networked is a really important one. And I think um, beyond the, the network of scientists in this space, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who are in various incubators around the country um, and in networks of health information technology. There's a lot of kind of local and regional ne networks um, that, that have a variety of different stakeholders in them. I think getting connected with those types of communities are just really very important um, to form the partnerships that will, will lead to, to great science. So thanks to both of you for joining us at the uh, virtual uh, fireside, uh, turning uh, things back to Sarah to close.
So I'm going to go ahead and thank everyone for their time and attention today, and especially thank Gary, Pat, and David for such a vibrant conversation. Your feedback is important to us, and we encourage you to complete the online evaluation. A link to the survey will open a new window once this session has concluded. Also, an archive of today's session will be made available on our website in about one week's time, so feel free to check that out. We hope to see you at our next session, which will be held in April. Registration details will be shared in the coming weeks. Thank you very much um, for joining this webinar. <laughs> you may disconnect at this time. Bye. Yeah.